So uh, I, um, <clears throat> I'm assuming that you're all aware of one of those uh, gender uh, differentiation myths that we hear from time to time about the differences uh, between men and women as it relates to being lost. Have you heard this before, you know, that women will ask for directions and men will not? You've heard this before? You seem to like that one. Um, anyway, um, it is not true in my world, um, in my world, that is to say in my house, uh, my, my women folk are very reluctant to ask for directions because they have excellent sense of direction, both of them, and they tend to know intuitively where they are and how to get there, yes? Me, not so much. So I have been known to go into a mall and come out and not remember where my car is, even though I went in five minutes before. I have absolutely no sense of direction, none. Um, and my first few days here at Bethany were very troublesome because this place, which is great because it's all on one level, yes, is spread all out. And I routinely, when I first came here, was lost as to where anything was because I had no sense of direction. One thing I will say, though, in terms of asking, is that we are be increasingly becoming a culture that doesn't like to ask because we have a strong sense of our own certainty. We already know. And that became very clear to me one day. Some of you know that I take the bus every day from Tan Talon to Scotia Square and then back. Maybe you don't, but I do. And one day, I was on the bus at Scotia Square going home around 6 o'clock, and the bus driver, in what I thought was an act of great humility, turned to all of us and said, well, folks, I just want you to know I'm a brand new bus driver. I've never done this route before, and I'm kind of, I'm, I'm a little bit nervous about how to find the way. And it was like blood in the water to sharks. <laughs> because everybody on my bus wanted to give him advice. And they were all certain. There was no edge of maybe, could be, you might want to check. It was. And as I sat there in the back of the bus, listening to what I thought were mild-mannered, gentle souls, engaging in a kind of, I know more than you do, don't go there, that's the wrong way to go, I thought we were going to have a fight on the bus. <laughs> Over all things, how to get 20 minutes away. I put my music in my ears and hoped and prayed it would work. It did. We have come a long way from a culture that deferred to authority figures for all knowledge to a place where we have great confidence in our own understanding of life. And in many ways, that's a good thing, right? It's a good thing that we have more confidence than we used to in our own selves. I will always remember my dear grandmother, who was very unwell and had been complaining about a lot of pain in her chest for months. So my mother made an appointment for my grandmother with her doctor, with her doctor. And, and so she brought me along to be a kind of shepherd, so my mom would pull up and I would take my grandmother in, yes. And then my grandmother saw her doctor, yes. And then my grandmother came out of the doctor's office and my mother and I were anxiously waiting to find out what the doctor had told my grandmother was wrong with the pain in her chest. She said he didn't mention it. <laughs> and we said, so when you told him that you had pain in your chest, what did the doctor say? 
And my grandmother said, oh, I didn't bring it up. <laughs> and we said, wait, 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 wait. Why didn't you tell the doctor that you had pain in your chest? Well, he's a doctor. He should know. <laughs> We've come a long way from that. Yes. I have a very good friend who is an emergency doctor at St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto. And he tells me that when he's engaging people with their ailments, they tell him what's wrong with them and have all of the information from Dr. Google. <laughs> Technology and what I think has been a very positive notion of our own self-esteem, that is to say, having confidence in our own selves, has brought together the, the, the access to information and our own confidence that we perhaps already know what we're looking for. And that is largely a very good thing. Yeah? However, that incredible confidence in our own knowledge and experience can come at a detriment. And that is on notions of what we don't know and learning something about the experience of others. Moreover, if you are a Christian and you believe that God is in your life and is guiding you in your life and is a presence in your life and has given you the gift of life, being open to what God is showing you that you don't already know is a gift of humility. If you have it all figured out and you already know everything you need to know, where is the opportunity to grow? So Micah is one of the great prophets like Amos and Hosea and Isaiah. And these prophets, particularly these prophets of the Old Testament, were renowned for standing in the midst of their own people and truth-telling, which is a sweet way of saying they made people very uncomfortable because as prophets, their role was to say to the people, our ways are, in, are insufficient, our ways are incorrect, and we need to change. And if we don't change, there will be in our midst injustice, we will eventually start to rot both from without and from within and as a whole society we will fall into decline, corruption and we will begin to disintegrate. And the prophets would remind the people of the covenant which they were practicing when they were truly living their faith uh, with God and with each other. And some of the consequences of not living the covenant, as we were called to do, were, and, and I was listening to the, the psalm, the responsive psalm that Linda was leading us through. If you look at those words in the psalmist, there is a very strong sense that as people become further and further distance from the covenant, they, they, they care less about the honesty and integrity of their actions. So they begin to cheat each other, and they begin to lie to each other, and they begin to be selfish, and they begin to care less about each other. And so the rich don't care about the poor, and those who are collecting money take more than they need. And people in general begin to retreat from each other, from God, and only are interested in their own well-being. And that transition is what leads the prophet to say, enough. Things have to change. And Micah was speaking to 
a society that was beginning both to rot from without, that is, it was becoming a very unjust place where the rich were getting rich and the poor were getting poor and rot from within. People were practicing a kind of um, a deceit, cheating, lying, all of that. And so the, the society was beginning to disintegrate and Micah speaks. And his opening salvo is to say, you all imagine that in the midst of this injustice, in the midst of this immorality, you may imagine that what is required of you is to sacrifice, is to somehow penalize yourself, to look into your midst and take that which you don't need and give it away. Well, fine. But that's not really what our God asks of us. No, we are called to love kindness and justice and to walk, and what's the word? Humbly with our God. And that's the word I want to focus on this morning. To walk humbly with our God. Because I am convinced that we cannot truly understand empathy compassion, understanding, unless we are humble. Most of the empathy, almost all of the empathy I have learned in my human life has come from listening and being in the presence of those whose experiences were different than mine. And we live in a time when diversity is increasing, and that's a good thing. However, we also live in a time when we can live on our own without the other increasingly. So we have this strange kind of dynamic where on one hand, we're surrounded by difference. On the other hand, our need of the other from a purely survival point of view is less. And so, even though we're surrounded with diversity, we're not always in contact with the other. I want to share with you just a couple of examples of where lifting your eyes above your own experience can bring us to a reality of humility. I, um, I mentioned earlier that Sean Parker is going to be a speaker at African History Month uh, on Tuesday afternoon at 12 noon. I had uh, coffee with Sean um, at the Nook, which is a coffee shop on Gottagen Street. And we were easily the two loudest people in the coffee shop. So everybody was listening. And as we were talking, we discovered that the two of us were roughly the same age. We both loved the same things. We would played sports all our lives. And yet, growing up in Halifax, neither of us had ever met. Hmm. In this city, people of color are often not a part of the life of those of us who live from, if you will, a Western European background. And increasingly, I find that in my circle of friends, I am not engaging enough with people who are different than me, at least not in matters of race and ethnicity. And I find that as I have those conversations, as I did with Sean, I become more understanding of what it's like to grow up and live in Halifax as a person of color. Which means when you walk into a store, the manager follows you. It means that when you go in for a job interview, you're asked if you have a criminal record right away. It means that there is a level of suspicion that when you're walking down the street, the Caucasian person is looking over the shoulder at you all the time. What's it like to grow up with that level of distrust and disrespect. What does that do to a person? 
And as I listened to Sean, and we had coffee together, I felt my understanding of his experience grow. It required me to take what I knew and put that over here and take what I didn't know and open myself to someone who did. And in that humility, I was able, I feel, to grow in understanding justice and what justice means for all God's people. One other example. I've shared this example before, but in this particular context, it bears repeating. Kindness. Kindness. In, in the way I was brought up, kindness was expressed in the what you were given. So my m dear mother taught me the act of hospitality. When someone comes into your midst, you offer them something. Yes? You offer them something. What do I do? What do I do? Right? When I was in the midst of the L'Arche community, which is the community founded by Jean Vanier, where people who have a variety of physical and mental challenges live with people who do not live with those. I went to a worship service one night. And there in the midst of the circle were a whole range of people of different abilities. And I remember one person speaking and saying, we talk a lot about love and what love is. This person said, for me, she said, I am a person who because of physical limitations is not able to do a variety of things that those in the end of the circle may take for granted. So when I experience love, it is when I feel as though I belong. And feeling like I belong is something more than just receiving something. It's in the way that the person's face reveals their welcome. It's in the touch. It's in the energy that the person brings into our relationship. And I remember thinking to myself, that is an experience and an understanding that as a person who has been raised with all of the um, advantages that I have in my life, I did not understand. That when we are with people and we make them feel or help them to feel like they belong, we are going beyond reciprocity. We are in some deep way experiencing something that, that only those who have been passed over and neglected could ever truly teach us. And all of us need that. And by the way, let me just say this. When I heard that from that particular woman on that night, I realized that there are a whole range of us who deep down worry that despite all of the things we've done in our lives, are we truly loved for who we are? So these are things that I learned by, by suspending what I know and opening myself to what I didn't. And I pray that all of us in our community of faith will open ourselves, be open in conversation, whether it's a coffee hour or a joy lunch <clears throat> or any of the events that we have, that we would listen to each other. Not so that we can tell the other what we know, but so we can learn from what God is doing with the other in our midst. Amen. In our prayers of the people, I want to um, once again just remind those, I know Anne mentioned this, 
our, our book study in, in our fall faith study is The Return of the Prodigal Son. It's based on a book written by Henry Nowlin. It's a very short book. And all, not all, what he does is he takes the three characters from the prodigal son, the eldest son, the youngest son, and the father, and he imagines himself in each of their shoes and how he would feel in that story. And we will be exploring how we feel, putting ourselves in the shoes of each of these characters. And so as we pray today, I invite you to put yourself in the shoes of the other who humbly walks with God. Let us pray. God, in our deepest humility, we come with open hands and open hearts and open minds. We come to be filled, not just with knowledge, not just with love, but with understanding. We come to understand how you are alive in the other. There is so much about our life that is a mystery. There is so much for us to know. And we are called into community by you in relationship. For we know that when we love our neighbor, you are present with us. In these relationships with our neighbor, in this relationship with you, we discover who we really are and we discover how to heal, how to love, how to be joyful, how to act justly, and how to give kindness. Help us to grow, to grow at our deepest point so that we love one another as you have loved us. Teach us, God. Move us, make us whole. In Jesus' name, amen.